Indeed. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Is the sound all right for you in the back? Good. Okay, very good. Um, welcome. And I really want to let you know that we have a very, we're, we are very honored because the library is not open. However, the librarian showed up here so that he could be here to open it for us. This is David Santos, and we owe him a huge, huge round of applause. And he has committed to being here <laughs> for the next two meetings because we have it reserved for next month and the following month. Um, and I just can't tell you how much we appreciate this, David. Thank very you. Long. Thank you very much. Um, if you need to use the library here in Roseland, it's open Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 11 till 6. 11 till 6. But we are special. We are supposed to use this door, however, unless you have mobility issues. And then David said he would open that door so those of us that have difficulty with steps can use it. Um, the restrooms are available. And they're pretty strong. Again, David, thank you. Very much. Very much. Uh, there's just maybe a tiny little bit of business that I need to confess to. Um, our bylaws, when I took over, were very, very involved. And I tried to simplify them. But I didn't get all everything out. And the board actually last fall worked on revising the bylaws. And then things kind of went south in my life a little. And I got busy. And we haven't fixed them. We were supposed to have um, a slate of officers. <laughs> um, but that's not happened yet. And it's, you know, so what, what I think we'll do is even though I know it's not, it's not within the bylaws because they haven't been approved and passed by, by our membership, um, we're going to go ahead and present the slate of officers next month. Um, and I can have Janet put it in the newsletter. Um, and then we are supposed to vote next month on officers because our fiscal year goes from June through um, May. Um, so that's, I have to confess, it's my fault. We have some revisions we're going to make that I'm hoping will make it easier for us so we don't slip up like this. I think that that's all that I needed to, to say because we have a very special person we need to listen to. And Siobhan, I would like to turn this over to you. Siobhan Slated is our program chairman. this this year and next year if you have suggestions for speakers we're always open for ideas and Bruce actually solicited us <laughs> and he had gotten one of our newsletters through the Friends of the Indian Museum and and he contacted us and so I'm just so thankful that you did thank you uh, you're Oops. Uh -oh. no, go ahead. Okay, so um, Dr. Bruce Love, he's a PhD from, he has his PhD in anthropology from UCLA in 1986, and he moved into the Antelope Valley in 1976, and has been doing archeology span in California and Mesoamerica, especially the Maya er area, ever since. He is the author of two books on the Mayan culture and has hundreds of archaeology reports in the Antelope Valley and surrounding regions. He also has a book on the Mayan history for sale for $20, and we're going to kind of push him to maybe develop a book 
<laughs> for us. Um, <laughs> that would be, I, I like and, that idea. Uh, he is the president of the Friends of the Inlet Valley Indian Museum and is the Native American liaison for the Museum of Art and History, also called, I, do they pronounce it, MOA? MOA. In Lancaster, the M-O-A-H. And so without further ado, Dr. Bruce Love, we'd love to have you come and share with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the book over there on, it's not on Maya history so much as it is on contemporary Maya uh, ceremonial practice in the small villages in the Yucatan Peninsula. I did my PhD field work down there, learning to speak the Mayan language and getting into the ancient Maya history and deciphering the hieroglyphs. And so I'm kind of, a uh, I've dedicated like the last 40 years of my life to studying Mayan culture and Mayan history. And so this is a book on uh, field work that I did there in the small t villages uh, where they do the ceremonies, like the rain ceremonies and the healing ceremonies and things like that. So if you're interested, it's a little off topic compared to what we're here to for tonight, but Siobhan insisted I bring my books, so I did. Um, is this okay with the light? I think it's good, yeah. Everybody okay? Yeah. Right. yeah. So, I'm Bruce Love. I got my PhD at UCLA in 1986. But I started doing archaeology out here in, in uh, the 70s. Um, they have a thing called contract archaeology or CRM, cultural resource management. That's when a developer comes in to put in a new housing track. They're required to hire an, a professional archaeologist to inspect the land and make sure that there's no uh, Indian burial grounds or historic buildings or you know anything important like cultural resources. And uh, so I, my first job was up in Sand Canyon in Tatchby and I got to know uh, Harold Williams of Kawaisu who has just, just passed a couple of years ago. Uh, I worked with him and I got to know some of the native peoples in the Antelope Valley. And then I got busy with my, you know, my academic career and whatnot. I moved to Riverside in 1990 at the University of California Riverside. And I lived it down there for until 2003 and then moved back up to the Antelope Valley. And my wife and I built an adobe house in Juniper Hills up in the foothills behind Little Rock. We bought 10 acres of raw land and drilled a well and built an adobe house that we were living in today. So uh, now I'm back more and more active again with the local uh, anthropology, archaeology, and getting more and more involved with the local tribes. So I want to, that's what this is all about, is a Native American presence here in the Antelope Valley. Um, now my clicker is here. And so the thing that drives the Indians crazy the most is when people talk about them in the, in the past tense because they're still here. This is a, this is a Fernandinho Tatavayam band of, of Mission Indians. You can see their, their name Whoop. up here. And they're singing bird songs. And these are songs that have been passed down from generation to generation from their ancestors on down to today. And this is a way that they have that their ancestors still speak to them and still speak through them. So people always ask, well, who were the Indians of the Antelope Valley? So what we have is that we can't really say which tribe occupied the Antelope Valley because we have, it was an overlap area. It was over, there was a, they um, shared, there were tribes that shared the Antelope Valley. And you'll notice on this map that there's no borders. On almost all maps you see of tribes, they have borders. The, here, this was the Tataviam, this was the Van Yume, this was the Serrano. This, they never had borders. They always were interacting and, and, 
and, and they didn't have territories. They had lineages. They belonged to family lineages. They intermarried. They had long distance trade going on and so forth and so on. And still today, that's true. There's uh, something like 200 uh, Tataviam living in the Antelope Valley. Their headquarters is in the San Fernando Valley, but they, but they, they live here. And so the Tataviam are, are um, like down the Acton, Agua Dulce, Santa Clarita. That's more or less their, their home their uh, home area. The Serrano, the uh, Interstate 15, uh, Victorville, and then the San Bernino Mountains, that's all Serrano country. Serrano, of course, is a Spanish word meaning mountains, mountaineers, but, that ain't, but that's really what they call themselves. Uh, the Van Yume occupied the, uh, the Mojave River between Victorville and Barstow in that area. Those were the Van Yumes. And then out in the desert, leading all the way out to the Colorado River, darn it, uh, giving away my show. Uh, all the way out to the Colorado River, the Chemehuevis, they call themselves the New Wool. And they have a reservation out on the river across from Parker, but they were, uh, they, they traveled throughout the Colorado desert, or the Mojave Desert, and, um, had trade routes, they had salt trade, they, they traded salt all throughout the uh, California. And then up in the Owens Valley, you have the Paiutes. And then uh, in the Tehachapi area, the Kawaisu or the Nuwa. And um, so the Katanamuk or the Tahone Indian tribe of today, they're the uh, Gorm from Gorman, Fort Tahone, and on down into the uh, San Joaquin Valley is the Katanamuk. So those are the tribes that shared the Antelope Valley and still do today. Um, what did the Antelope Valley look like 10,000 years ago? This is what it looks like today. You can see the uh, dry lakes, of course, and um, it's pretty easy to see where we are there. But 10,000 years ago, it would have looked more like this. At the end of the Ice Age. 10,000 years is a rough, a rough uh, date for the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of the Holocene, or that's the, the, the last the 10,000 years that we're in now. Um, major climate change, sea level changes, Sea levels rose 300 feet at the end of the Ice Age when the glaciers all melted. Um, and there was big game back then. In, in, in the Ice Age, there were the, the, uh, the big game, the, the woolly mammoths and the uh, bison and the, the horse was here. I mean, large mammals were here and the big game hunters were the native peoples that well they're the archaeologists call them paleo indians that means the oldest indians um, today these are dry lakes but uh, we can see old shorelines it's possible to see older shorelines around the dry lakes and these were uh, oftentimes that's where the archaeologists find the artifacts from these older time periods how do we know that they're that old? Well, we'll get into that. Um, the oldest point type, the oldest uh, projectile point type is called the Clovis point. And they're from 11,000 to 9,000 BC. So add 2,000 years to that, that's 13,000 to 11,000 years ago is when these types of points were used. And these were in the Ice Age, at the end of the Ice Age, these were used for big game hunting. They've been found actually embedded in mammoth bone, you know, at, at kill sites where the, the Paleo Indians were killing the mammoths. And we have one of these from Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, this is what the, they look like uh, as far as technical drawings, uh, you know, in archaeology manuals where they have technical drawings. And uh, the thing about them is this, this flute, it's called the fluted base, where um, 
this is where it was hafted onto the onto the spear and also it allowed for thrusting and pulling out so they would actually go up they wouldn't throw these at the at the large game they would go up and actually thrust them in and pull them out and uh, modern bayonets have that same kind of fluting and knives have that so that it, it doesn't create a suction when you pull it out it allows you to pull it out and this was a and it's very tricky technology to if you ever tried flint napping and making your own arrowheads it's not easy but um, so this is the hallmark of these fluted points and out at Edwards we found a base of one now it's all the reason it's all uh, rounded like that is it's been sandblasted because it's been on the it was on the surface for a th 10,000 years or whatever and it's been sandblasted and that's why it's it's uh, rounded like that but if we put it in against the drawing it matches perfectly and so this is the base of a clovis point that was found at edwards air force base around the edge of the of the lake the dry lake so we have evidence of indians being here twelve thousand years ago and here we have the the uh, technical explanation for it, the tools in association with the extinct mammoth in the Clovis occupation, 9,500 to 9,000 BC, to add 2,000 to that. And so this is what the lakes might have looked like. This is today is Paiute Ponds, which is uh, the southwest corner of Roseman Dry Lake, where it's wet today because of effluent or, or overflow from the water treatment plants south of uh, uh, north of Lancaster and uh, they have they have runoff that goes into this and, and maintains these ponds but after rainfall and everything there there's there's a lot of moisture a lot of water out there still and a lot of archaeological sites with artifacts another artifact is this distinctive of that uh, of the early time period are what we call crescents and these are mysterious because nobody really knows exactly what they were for you can see why they got their name crescents and they date from 9000 to 6000 or 5000 bc so let's add 2000 to that 11000 to 8000 years ago and um there's a, there's a report that came out of Edwards Air Force Base not too long ago where they found some new, new finds of more crescents. And there's some that were just found like eight years ago in 2015. And these date from, like I say, 9,000 years ago. And where those pin flags are, these are, these are places where artifacts were found during a survey around the, the dry lake beds. Here's another one, and then, and there's some more. And one, one of the theories is, this was a, a, a publication in a journal where they propose a theory that these crescents were used for uh, hunting waterfowl. And because they found evidence of, of people, living people, that have used similar kinds of things for knocking birds out of the air. In other words, they didn't try to shoot the bird to penetrate or shoot into the bird, but they uh, tried to knock it down out of the air. And so that's the theory of, for the crescents, is that um, they might have been used in that way. But nobody really knows. But what's interesting is that they track the um, places where crescents have been found. They've, plot, they've plotted the places where crescents have been found, and then they overlay that with, um, excuse me, they overlay that with um, migratory waterfowl uh, paths, and it kind of matches up. So where they find crescents, they also find waterfowl. And this is uh, Paiute Ponds. Here's, whoops, 
I keep hitting the wrong button, darn it. Um, here's Rosamond Dry Lake, the southwest corner. And this is where the water comes in from the treatment facility. But this was also a natural wet area. It's, uh, in fact, Amargosa Creek that comes all the way from the Leona Valley ends up here in this kind of a delta area, in a marshy area. And it's just covered, littered with archaeological remains in this area because it was a, a rich area for a game for hunting game and collecting resources of all kinds. And these, these blue circles are areas where crescents were found during one of the major surveys back in 2015. And so it's interesting, here's Paiute Ponds, and it's interesting today they use it for hunting waterfowl. And it's kind of interesting to think that maybe they've been hunting waterfowl there for 9,000 years, and that what we're doing today is just a continuation of what people have always done at Paiute Ponds. Ta-da! <laughs> so here's a, what some people call Lake Thompson was a, a lake in the Antelope Valley during the wet period. Some people speculated there was a period during the Holocene, like three to 5,000 years ago, where this lake returned. I don't know too much about it. I, I need to learn more about it. But this would be the old shoreline of Lake Thompson. Um, and you all know where Willow Springs is, because we're right in your own backyard here. There was a archeological project was done for a new, um, power tra uh, transmission lines that were going in near Willow Springs, and that required a, uh, an archeological study. And the person who did the archeological study found remains, here, here's, he found lots of sites. Here's uh, Hamilton Road, Wagon Wheel Ranch. You all know this area. Um, in his survey and excavations, they found, they found um, artifacts that went back to 8810 before present, 8,800 years before present, and 7680 before present. And this was a shell, this was shell this is both shell, and they were, what they were, they were shell beads. Shell beads that the Indians had uh, traded from the coast, and uh, they were found out here by uh, Willow Springs, and were dated. The C-14 dating is, uh, you know, is the way we date things. Uh, some things can't be dated, and some things can. Here's an excavation there, and then, out here by, uh, in Lake Los Angeles, I'm, most of you probably know where Lake Los Angeles is. There was an excavation there that went down almost 10 feet and we're still finding artifacts all the way down. This is over two meters, two, 260, two meters and 60 centimeters down. That's like eight, eight to nine feet deep. And we were still finding artifacts at the bottom. We never got to the end of it. We just had to close it down for safety reasons. And at the bottom, we found a point. Um, now, you might think that this is the point, but it's not. This is the stem that was in the shaft. It's hafted in the shaft. And this is the point up here. And these are a particular style and type of point called... Uh, and here's another one. Here's, here's the shaft that's embedded, and then this is the point up here. And this style is called the Lake Mojave stemmed, or the Great Basin stemmed cluster. So all these have these stems that are shaft, or hafted into the shafts. And we found one of those out there, right there here in the center of the Antelope Valley in, a, in an archaeological site. We couldn't get a date on it, but according to the style of point that it is, here's ours that we found. It fits perfectly on this page here. And this page of 
artifacts dates from 9,000 to 6,000 BC. So that's 11,000 to 8,000 before present. So there was obviously a major occupation here in the Antelope Valley for the last 10,000 years. And as far as we can tell, there's never been a break. There's never been a time when it wasn't occupied. There's another point type, which comes more recently in time, comes later, which is called the Pinto points. And these are uh, named after the Pinto Basin in Joshua Tree. That's where they were first found. But they were found all across the, the western United States. This particular type of point was found, um, is found, and dates from a particular time period. But here's the, uh, it's called the Pinto Cluster or the Pinto type point. And these have been found also here in the Antelope Valley. And they date from 6,000 to 3,000 BC. So now we're moving up in time into the, into the middle Holocene. And what these are are atlatl points. The atlatl is a, also known as a spear thrower. This was a weapon that basically it, it takes a spear, but it, it, it extends your arm. It extends your arm an, an extra 18 inches so that the spear is thrown twice as fast, twice as hard, and it penetrates. And I've seen the YouTubes of you know bringing down a, a buffalo with one of these, or a uh, not uh, not saying that these were used on buffalo, but I, I've seen them. They can they can penetrate a large animal and bring it down because of the the atlatl is a technology used around the world. It, it was into, it was invented independently in several places around the world. This is an Aztec name, by the way, Atl, Atl. The uh, language of the Aztecs is also shared with the people of the, uh, of the Southwest, the udo aztecan language family. But anyway, so these types of points were not arrow points, and they were not spear points, they were atlatl points. And here's, a, here's another one. And here's another one. And this one, I believe, was found by Mr. Jonathan Neumer at um, Devil's Punch Bowl. And his dad let me photograph it. And this is an Elko style. It's called Elko Eared. The different point types have different names, different styles. Bruce, yeah. question right down here. Question, yes, sir. Roughly, how big are these points? I mean, you get kind of a false thing looking at them. On there. Like sometimes they look really little, and sometimes they look kind of huge. Okay, yeah, good question. So, uh, so these, let me go. Sorry, I didn't have a scale on these, yeah. Uh, should be a scale. Uh, okay, uh, two inches, two inches high, roughly. They get smaller with the more recently the, you get, the, the smaller they get. So they start big and then they get smaller and smaller over time until we get to the most recent ones are a little less than an inch. They're like three quarters of an inch. But those are arrowheads. And those are arrowheads, exactly, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, so the Elko Cluster from 1500 BC to 600 AD, this is around the time that bow and arrow was introduced to this part of North America, was around 500 AD, the, the, the anthropologists are estimating, or you know, the archaeologists are estimating, around 500 AD, the, inter the arrow was, we wouldn't say it was invented, we say it was introduced from outside the area and people started using it and so the point types changed and then we get into arrow points and this is called a desert side notch because obviously because of the notches on the side and these are usually pretty small like uh inch and a quarter inch and a quarter high it takes a lot of skill to make these incredible if you've ever tried it it's really really uh, hard and so if you look at these, uh, 
you look at these um, point types over time, this is a, a series, remember the, Mo, the, uh, the Lake Mojave stemmed points with, from 9,000 years old? This is the oldest here, and then this is the youngest, is right here, what we call the cottonwood triangular. And these are the little, uh, like I say, three quarters of an inch high. And they're the most recent. They're the ones that they were, some people call them bird points because they're so small, they might have been used for shooting quail or something like that, you know, bird, birds. So this on the left is the uh, desert side notch. And on the right is a cottonwood triangular. And these are hallmarks of the, the bow and arrow period in the most, more recent period. And these have also been found here in the AV, of course. Um, what am I showing here? Barrel Springs Road, Pear Blossom Highway. Right here is Barrel Spr Right here is a major spring, Barrel Springs. I think that's what, yeah. So this is Barrel Springs, and even today, they're coming out from under the aqueduct, there's a pipe with a water flowing out of the pipe. Constant flow, like two or three inches diameter flow of water coming out from Barrel Springs under the aqueduct. They put the aqueduct over the top of it and destroyed a lot of archeology. span uh, But a lot of the archeology span is still, still intact and the ranch that was there, uh, people collected a lot of stuff on the ranch, and a lot of that is now out at the Antelope Valley Indian Museum. And if you haven't been to the Antelope Valley Indian Museum, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, I'm the president of the Friends of the Antelope Valley Indian Museum. We're the support group that, you know, that um, tries to raise money for them. And yeah, question? <clears throat> yes, sir. As a rock hound, I would like to get your take on people finding uh, arrowheads and such in assorted places and picking them up and bringing them home because there are two distinct groups that are constantly battling that and they think they should leave them where they lay. Uh -huh. The other side says, why? So somebody can walk all over and crush them and then they're gone. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of good points are made. You're right. And uh, I'd like to know what you think of that. Well, I would leave it there myself. I would leave it there myself because once you take it out of context, you're destroying the information that was there. But I, I, but I also realize that I can't expect other people to think the way I think. I, that's not realistic. And they, and they don't. And so there are people, I mean, it's hard. It, it would be pretty hard not to pick up an arrowhead and take it home with you if you found it. But I wouldn't pick it up. But, I, but I've seen hundreds of thousand arrowheads, you know, so it's not that big a deal to me. Once you put it up on your shelf, what good is it doing anybody? It's just, a, it's your personal collection. It uh, doesn't help anybody uh, that I can see. And uh, it is, uh, it's taking a little page of history and tearing it out of the book. So it's no longer historical. It's similar to the rape and pillage of the cabins and the mines. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go to certain uh, mine shafts and the iron rails that yeah. ripped out. I mean, it's just a same idea. Yeah. So anyway, um, we just have to find our own moral compass, I guess, and do what we can. Um, this. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, Barrel Spring, this, the, the collection from Barrel Springs from the turn of the century is now out at the Antelope Valley Indian Museum, and, uh, which is an amazing place in its own right. And I highly recommend if, if you haven't been there, or even if you have, to go back and visit it again. I'm not sure what the hours are now. They're always limited in their hours, but they're getting a, their budget back together and they're getting new employees and volunteers. So uh, we're hoping to expand the hours and, and whatnot. Um, but these collections are there at the museum. This is from Barrel Springs. This steatite arrow shaft straighteners, these were used for, um, for obviously for straightening arrow shafts. And you could heat these. 
the soapstone retains heat. You can heat it without it breaking. And then you can use these heated uh, inst uh, implements to, and then you, you run the arrow shaft back and forth through it and turn it and bend it until you straighten it. Because uh, arrow shafts are never and naturally straight in mother nature you have to straighten them and that's what these shafts were for and you find these and some of them are decorated even so this tells you a lot about the people that they had gone beyond the point of just barely surviving or barely utilizing the minimum what they need they they've gone beyond that and started decorating their instruments and their tools yeah and so that tells you that they've reached a certain level of social complexity or uh, well, kind of a wealth in their own way. And the soapstone, there's a, most soapstone probably was imported from the Channel Islands, but there are some soapstone sources that I know of anyway in the Sierra Polona Mountains up be, behind Acton. There is some soapstone there. You may know of sources out in this area that I don't know about. So maybe after, afterwards you could be, tell me about those. Um, this is a point that was found at uh, Barrel Springs site. <coughs> Excuse me. This was probably a heating stone that they would, uh, they could tie a, a cord or a rope in the hole and then they would, well first of all you would heat it in a fire and then you could take it out of the fire and then with a stick or something, you could lower it into a basket full of water and boil the water. Or cook food, you know, cook mush, uh, cook acorns and that sort of thing in baskets of water using these stones like this. And then here's a steatone, steatite bowl or soapstone bowl completely hollowed out. And these are komals or, or heating slabs. This could be placed over the fire and then uh, parched. You could seeds, <coughs> seeds and nuts and things could be parched on the surface like a komal. <laughs> these are all from the Barrel Springs site. This is really interesting to me because this is a granite bowl. They talk about um, when the bowls get so deep or when the grinding stones get so deep, they kill it at the end by breaking a hole in the bottom to kill it. But this wasn't discarded after it was killed because after it was killed, ah, darn it, after it was killed, they uh, painted the design on it in the hole itself. So I've never seen this before. I mean, I always thought when uh, something was killed, then it was done. But in this case, they decorated it after it was killed. So it must have had some special significance. What's uh, really kind of uh, touchy, it may very well have come from a burial site. Because something like this would very likely be uh, buried with a, an individual. And so the person who dug this up was actually desecrating grave sites, probably. We don't know for sure. That's another whole issue to get into. This is the earliest uh, map we have of the Barrel Springs site with the California aqueduct and the heavy midden area. This was uh, Jay Tremblay and, and I forget her name, Robin, Roger Robinson's ex-wife uh, back in 77. And then uh, I excavated there with UCLA, I forget what year, 86 maybe. And we put in test units, excavation units, and then drew a map of the, the areas that we collected and we, where we excavated. And then when you dig down a unit um, into the ground, this is a, a profile of a unit that's dug down into the ground. So this is a sidewall. This is a rough sketch, you know, you, you make a rough sketch and then later you clean it up for publication. So this is a, the sidewall of the unit and with the different um, things that you can see. So the, old, the farther down you go, the older it gets. And here's another sidewall drawing. And it's from these uh, sidewalls that we, or, or from these certain levels that we get material that's datable. 
and we found carbon that was dateable. We got one date of 2640 before present, BP is before present, and another one of 5110 before present. And these were in the units that we excavated at Barrel Springs. Now out there in Lake Los Angeles, Stephen Sorensen County Park, there is an archaeological site that is um, has been radiocarbon dated or C14 dated to 2,700 or 3,000 years ago. But this is also where we found that stemmed point that from that really deep unit that was almost 10 feet deep and we found that stemmed point and that dates from 9,000 years ago but we don't have a radiocarbon date from that that's just dated on stylistic grounds is there a question yeah just for verification when it comes to the uh, your sidewall uh, information there and the age and that kind of stuff normally it's what when it's deeper, it's older. Were these deeper when they uh, were they older with being deeper? Or? They were, but the, the heights and age right there. In that case, where we had the 2,000 and the 5,000, one was about uh, 18 inches down, and the other was about four feet down. So it was older. So it was older right. The deeper. But there is a problem here in California with rodent activities, with with ground squirrels and, and whatnot, digging. You know. Mixing, mixing everything up. This is a destruction that the, the developers did out at Lake LA, out at Lovejoy Springs. I shouldn't, this was a, there's a 3,000 year old village site there that was just literally bulldozed by the developers before there were any laws. This was 1968, 67, 68. And they just did a terrible job. But they, they exposed a, a mass gravesite out there. And the dates from it have come back at 2,700 and 2,400. And uh, there's a unit we put in out there. Uh, near that, we found a uh, feature in the unit, probably a roasting pit. These are like fire affected rocks, probably a roasting pit. And we got a date off of this of like uh, 2,000 something years old. So people have been here a long time. Here's uh, radiocarbon dates from the uh, from other sites in the Antelope Valley, also with in this time period. So, like I say, we have continuous occupation from 12,000 years to the present. Yes, sir. You don't mind if I ask another question. So when it comes to the oldest occupants, what tribe might they be? We don't know. Sure, right? Yeah, there's no way of knowing that. Only the only as far as the names of the tribes, we only know from from the period when the Spaniards arrived and the the first the first non natives came in and wrote about them, you know. And they said this is the Van Yume group and this is the Tatabiam group and so forth. Okay. So, going back, yeah, we don't know. Yes, ma'am. How far down have you gone in the excavation? That one at Lake LA was probably the deepest one I've ever been in, uh, oh, which was like two meters sixty, two sixty. That's like eight feet, eight or nine feet. And recently, they found one in Palm Springs. That's where monitoring comes in. When you monitor during construction, and you have the heavy equipment doing the digging for you, then you get you find stuff way down that you could never reach by hand. You know, you sort of take advantage of the uh, what the heavy equipment's doing. They found one recently in Palm Springs, like 12 feet down, that was um, 9,000 years old. Yeah, and so now we're out to the uh, west side. We have some folks from Ninoc here, uh, out by the Poppy Reserve. The uh, Fairmont Buttes out there, <clears throat> there's a rock ring, there's a series of rock rings on one of these buttes that are probably really old, but we don't know, really know what they were. There's like a three or four of these circles, rock circles. They may be hunting blinds, don't know for sure. 
But what we do know for sure is the uh, rhyolite source out there. This, rhyolite, this natural rhyolite that's eroding out of the hillside there was a major source of tools for the Indians of the Antelope Valley and beyond. It was probably traded way beyond. This is a what we call a core. This is a core that's been flaked. All these flake scars are man-made or human-made by Native Americans who were coming here and knocking off flakes to take with them, to put in their bag, take back to the main camp, and then create uh, arrowheads or knives or blades of, or tools of different sorts. This rhyolite is a very high quality rhyolite. And you can find these cores and flakes all over, thousands of them there. It's an amazing sight. And we know they had a, like a permanent camp there because of the mortars here. This is their, their grinding holes. <coughs> and there was a stream that went right about, right through there. So they had water. Here's, here's their grinding holes. And then their rhyolite source is just right around, right down in, in around the bend here in that canyon there is the, the rhyolite source. So you, we had a permanent campsite with, with water and uh, and the rhyolite, they were, maybe they were trading, maybe they, were, they controlled the rhyolite uh, trade. And, uh, you know, we don't know for sure, but we can speculate. This is their, their for pounding their uh, seeds and acorns and what all. They did not have corn. The, the Indians of California did not grow corn. That, that more or less stops at the Colorado River. The Southwest had corn, but out here in California, they did not. They were collectors. They collected, uh, but they did not have agriculture. They, had, they, they managed the wild. A lot of people, you know, the Indians I talked to today, they hate the term hunters and gatherers because it makes, you, it makes them sound like they're just like wandering around hoping to find something, when in fact they were managing the landscape carefully, knowledgeably, with generations, thousands of years of skill to prune the trees, to, pr to burn the grass, to weed the, gra to weed the places. Uh, they were managing the landscape to get the best crops from the natural world. And they were expert at it. So they weren't hunters and gatherers in that sense. Now this is where the Antelope Valley Freeway came through in 1960 something. Anybody know the date? Where well, This is uh, just south of Palmdale. Three, I think. 63. I, what? 63? I think. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> you, I want to ask any of you, this is a trick question, but does anybody see the, the house over here on the hillside? I'll zoom in a little bit closer. Anybody see the house? Up top. Right there. There. They've, this was found at that time, and this is a remains of an actual Indian house right there next to the freeway. <clears throat> and it has, art, it has artifacts outside, where the, the grinding stones, you know, where they did the, they lived mostly outside and would just sleep inside. And, um, there's a, a kitchen area, you might say, with a fire pit and the grinding stones. And a, a fence area, they maybe had like chickens or something, you know, it's hard to say. They had a, a fence there. And this was all recorded. There, there's, the, there's the freeway going through up here. And this was all recorded by the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, uh, Charles Rosaire. And, uh, that was measured and, and described, you know, and reported on, and they took and they took notes and made drawings, and then they uh, and there they they're carting it off in the back of a pickup truck, and those poles, those posts are at the Antelope Valley Indian Museum in, in a storage room today. Sixty-three. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 
I would say that was like 19th century, uh, recent. recent. Yeah, historical, during historical times. Yep. And right across the freeway from that, there's another midden area, another archaeological site that was showed, shown to me. This is me visiting there in uh, probably in the mid 80s. And there was a, <clears throat> the soil is dark and ashy. And uh, that's the midden soil. It's got bits of burned bone and, and rock and, and bits of artifacts and ash. And it's, it's a result of people living there for centuries. And it's called midden, M-I-D-D-E-N. And there, there also was a rock wall there we found. It may have been another, like an animal pen or something like that. Very similar to the one across the, the, the uh, freeway. And right there, you see the arrowhead? Ta-da. There. There. <laughs> That's a cottonwood triangular. That's about five-eighths of an inch high. That would have been what some people call bird points for shooting small game. Maybe rabbit, you know. Although they use throwing sticks to knock rabbits down. But that's up here, the end of the scale, from, from the oldest to the newest. And this is out at Lake Los Angeles, Lovejoy Buttes. Lovejoy Springs is another one, same kind. It's interesting how they stick to a pattern, they stick to a template. There's a mental template that this is the correct type of point to make. They, they don't just, there's not just an infinite variety of shapes and sizes. And this is at my house in Juniper Hills where we found a mono, which is a handheld grinding stone for grinding back and forth. We just found this under a pine tree while we were building our house. <coughs> The surface, the surface here is smooth from the grinding. And then in rock art, we have rock art, which is uh, like pictographs. So there's two kinds of rock art. There's, there's petroglyphs and pictographs. The petroglyphs are carved or pecked into the rock. Like uh, many of you have been up to the Coso, uh, petroglyph, world-class petroglyph sites at Little, uh, forget what it's called. Huh? China Lake. China Lake, yeah. Um, at the Matarango Museum, you get tour, you have to go, to go on the base. Those are petroglyphs, but pictographs are painted. And this is a site near Lake Los Angeles on private property, thank goodness, they've been protecting this site forever. Right up in here is a cave, a small, like, I guess you'd call it a cave, that faces, it actually faces the winter, the sunrise on the winter solstice. The, the, the most light that ever goes in here is on sunrise on the winter solstice, and that's when this photograph was taken with the entire place is flooded with light. Later in the year, it's, it's all in shadow. And it has amazing uh, pictographs in it. And no graffiti, no damage, it's been perfectly preserved for who knows how long, thanks to the owners of that property. And uh, Devil's Punch Bowl, Big Rock, this is where Big Rock Creek comes, comes out into the uh, Valier, in Valiermo area. Here's Big Rock Creek here, here's Valiermo. And right here near the, the uh, where Big Rock Creek comes out, there's another uh, pictograph site. And in, um, what's it called? The uh, Crystal Air Country Club, which is in that area. A lady, uh, I got a call one day, this is back in the 80s, I used to be uh, the president of the uh, Antelope Valley Archaeological Society, it's kind of an amateur club, you know, we'd meet once a month 
uh, doing and have slideshows and stuff. And I got a call, and she said, this lady says she found this artifact in the golf course. It was like coming out of the ground in the golf course at the country club. And we went out there, and it's, it's carved out of soapstone. I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with this type of artifact myself. These are different views of it. This is about a foot, maybe 14 inches high. I didn't know what it was. But just by coincidence, around that same time, there was a publication came out, out of Cal State Fullerton by Constant Cameron on these, what they call bird stones or pelican stones from the Channel Islands that were carved out of soapstone. And that's what these are, uh, common bird stone shapes, pelicans type. And there was an exhibit there as a publication on the, the island dwellers of Southern California, because these all come from the Channel Islands. So if this was found in Crystal Air Country Club in the Antelope Valley, that's very interesting because that would indicate long distance trade between the Channel Islands and the Antelope Valley. But going back to the question earlier, how do we know where she found that? How do we know she didn't dig that up on the Channel Islands and she didn't want to admit it? And she told us that it came out of the golf course at Crystal Air Country Club. See, once you take an artifact away from its original context, it loses all its scientific value, basically. So, that, so we can't say there was long distance trade from the Channel Islands to the Antelope Valley based on that one Soapstone, pelican stone from Crystal Air. Yes, sir. What's it for? Effigies. To bury with people. It's uh, like a doll of a, of a pelican, like a, an effigy of a pelican. You, you'd bury that if you buried a dead one? Yes. Oh, okay. It's a power stone, a power symbol. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, because the pelicans that fly over the ocean you know, out at, if you're out on the islands and you see these big birds, yeah. they become your power, your, your, your uh, animal, spirit. animal spirit, you might say, your power companion. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And here's some more examples. There's a killer whale, a canoe, and a pelican. So the artifacts at the Antelope Valley Indian Museum, in fact, many of them from the Channel Islands were dug up illegally and are currently being repatriated and returned to the tribes. And they've been taken down out of their cases and the cases have been covered over and they're being returned to the Chumash people living on the coast uh, and the Luiseno people who consider that the Channel Islands to be their sacred homeland. And they were dug up by pot hunters, you know, artifact hunters. There's the Channel Islands. There's the Pelican. There's the one from Crystal Air Country Club. So here's the tribal territories with boundaries. Remember I showed you the map without boundaries? There were never boundaries. And the Indians will tell you that. There were never boundaries, you know. So here we've come up with this map now. The, uh, I work for the, uh, I don't work for it, well yes I do, the uh, Museum of Art and History in Lancaster, MOA, uh, has contracted with me to be their Native American liaison and I've done outreach to all these tribes all around the Antelope Valley and we have representatives from those tribes. <clears throat> we meet once a month on Zoom and, and uh, we're planning a big exhibit for 2024. And um, we came to, to begin with, we came up with this map of, uh, called, uh, called Tribes Without Boundaries or something like that. I mean, without borders, Tribes Without Borders. And because they never had borders. They always interacted with their neighbors and there was overlap and sharing and sometimes fighting, sometimes they were violent, you know, they had battles, but more than often, the ones around here were pretty friendly and they shared and they intermarried. And uh, here's some of the, the native names from the Kawaisu area or the Tehachapi Mountains, the, the Nuwa area. 
they have they ha have been able to recover some of their original names of their places. Here's ones from the uh, Tataviam band. Here's here's Acton here. Here's Newhall, and these are these are names like. Um, the, N the NGA ending, like Coenga, Topanga, uh, all these, uh, Morongo, or t what are some of the more common ones? Tahunga. That NGA, uh, Cucamonga is another one. The NGA means it's a place name. It's the place of. So Cucamonga is the place of Cucao. The Topa Topagna is the place of Topa. And then it got anglicized to Topanga, but it's the NGA is a, is the lock. It's called a locative in linguistics. It means the place of. That's why there's so many words end in NGA. It's na the place of. T topa. Topa na. Kawe na. Ya na. Hahamo na. So that's your linguistic lesson for the day. And uh, Professor Earle at the Anno Valley College has plotted all these uh, 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century, well, 18th and 19th century place names of Native American place names that we get from the historical record from the early Spanish, Spanish diaries and that sort of thing. Here's a... Uh, Here's Lancaster, here's Alpine, here's Palmdale would be right in here. And here's Leona Valley. This is Tataviam territory. This is stage station here. Uh, these, the, the, the numbers in blue are Native American place names or villages or prominent locations that were collected by the early explorers. Yes, sir. Those place names, there were Occupied uh, sometimes by the same tribe. I mean, each place name is not insinuating that there was a certain tribe that lived in that place. Not necessarily, because, like, for instance, as when the Spaniards came through from the Colorado River, they brought Mojave Indians with them as guides. The, the Mojaves guided the Spaniards into the Antelope Valley and they would tell the Spaniards the names of the tribes and the Spaniards would write it down. But sometimes they were derogatory names like uh, down around Acton, they call them the Eliklik and it means the people who can't speak properly. And, and the Spaniards wrote it down, oh, these are the Eliklik. And it turned out that it was the Mo what the Mojaves were calling the, their neighbors, the people who can't speak right. And so, yeah, these, the whole naming thing is tricky. Yes, sir. What's the basis for the language in the Antelope Valley, these particular Native Americans? You know, there's like, what, two or three in, you know. Right. They're, they're like, and most of the, almost, almost none of these tribes have any speakers left, native speakers left. They're trying to re, 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 uh, recuperate their language through old, like, wax cylinder recordings that the Smithsonian did back in the 19, teens and 1920s, but very few native speakers left, but they have, they do have old recordings and old notes and things. But the, the basic uh, language group is, uh, is affiliated with the uto aztecan language family, but I, I'm not too clear on which is which exactly. Thanks. Yeah, I, I should, I should uh, bone up on that and learn yeah, more about that. <laughs> Uh, where are we going next? Uh, we got to. Oh, so we're going to bring this to a close now. The, so I hope you all understand that um, that the native people are still here. It's, they've been here for twelve thousand years more. They'll tell you more. They say the archaeologists say twelve thousand, but they'll tell you they've always been here. They were created here. Their, their creation stories say that they were created here. The in fact there were several creations or the anim first the animals and then the plants or first the plants and then the animals and then the humans so 
don't talk about the Native Americans as in the past tense. That drives them crazy. And, and there, there's probably some in the audience right now. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one of the ways that they maintain their, their connection with the past, and I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, is through these bird songs. And if I can, I don't know if I'll be able to play this. I hope so. Yeah. So this was a gathering, this is like an annual gathering down in Palm Springs for the Kawea Indians, Kawea people. And, uh, but it's typical of what's going on today to bring the revitalization, to bring the energy, to bring the resilience, the survival. I mean, we didn't talk about the horrors of the 19th century with the, starting with the missions and then the settlers and the gold rush and the literal uh, ex extermination policies where Indians were literally hunted down. There were militias, state-sponsored militias to kill Indians. There were bounties, there was slavery. I mean, it, we didn't get into all that. You know, that's, there was barely, you know, by the turn, by the 1900, there was just remnants, shredded remnants of native culture. And today it's coming back resilience so and that's what this demonstrates these songs here so thank you very much for your attention i appreciate it